Perfect. Okay. Um, so hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm super exciting, ex excited to be presenting today and, and talk about, you know, the topic that I'm very passionate about um, and essentially go and performance and uh, maybe some misconceptions that I could see when I was working in open source with other teams. Um, so yeah, let's go. So first, um, what we will be talking about. First of all, I would like to kind of present you the misconception that I see, and I would like to motivate you to optimize the code to actually work a little bit on performance of, of the you know single plot process even um, Golang applications. You, we will learn about certain um, excuses of not doing performance, which might be sometimes right, but in some cases might be um, really um, not valuable. So we will see and we'll get into that. Next, we, I, will, I want to kind of explain how to approach performance optimizations if you choose to. And last but not the least, I would present three quite major optimization tricks and uh, pitfalls and um, be really vigilant about that because I will like to add some interaction. I will ask you um, to either speak up or just um, write answer on the chat and there will be some guessing, guessing time and, and debugging. All right, let's go. So um, before we start, a very short introduction. My name is Bartek Plotka. I am uh, actually working in London. I'm principal software engineer at Red Hat um, in the observability team and I co-founded um, like quite popular recently open source project called Thanos, which is uh, essentially for um, scaling Prometheus, which is like a system infrastructure system, very popular in communities for collecting metrics. Um, and I'm also maintaining that. Um, so you might you might know about Prometheus, hopefully. Anyway, I, I, I love doing stuff on open source. Actually, that's my daily job as well. So you could see uh, some of the projects um, live there as well. I'm also part, uh, very active in the CNCF organization, um, especially around observability. I'm a tech lead for the special interest group observability there. And I'm also um, still on call. I'm still doing SRE uh, tasks. Um, and I would really recommend doing that because that's, that's kind of how you actually test your software, actually ensure that what you write, what you develop makes sense. And I'm actually on call right now. So Hopefully there will be no page. Okay, right. um, some quick definition of the optimization. I'm pretty sure you are totally aware what it is, but um, in essence, this is a method of code modification that improves something. It can be you know um, smaller binary if you want to, maybe consume less memory, maybe executes you know faster. Really modifies anything, ideally with the soft requirement of um, not changing, you know, for the same input, there will be exactly the same output. So ideally, if you do any performance optimization, try to not change, you know, the APIs, the behavior, because you are just adding more unknowns. So that's a very good suggestion here. Um, all right. So let's imagine the situation very common in my experience you are proposing some performance optimization. You see, okay, I think this function is too slow. I think I see some problems. I would like to work on the optimizations on the performance. And you are sending some PRs and your code reviewer, maybe your tech lead, maybe manager are, you know, looking on the performance optimizations you made and, and, and saying, okay, I think you are just guessing here. I think this is just micro optimizations. I think you heard about this term, right? And uh, of course, that's a that's a very valid point. Like you usually, um, people usually prematurely optimize uh, the software and just you know take the effort without actually understanding if the outcome will be will be effective, right? Um, and and overall, this is not going with the Yagni rule. So um, you're not going to need it. So, so, so it might be, you know, it might be a right call. However, what I want to actually um, propose is that, sure, it can be micro, micro optimization um, for some cases. However, if you keep your optimization, optimization simple and you maintain a basic hygiene, 
Um, so code is readable and to use, uh, you know, Golang patterns. There are certain patterns that are not that, you know, complex. And even though maybe you don't need performance from the start of the writing your application, I would really suggest into uh, making sure you, you, you introduce those patterns no matter if you care about performance or not, just for hygiene and long-term healthiness of this project um, to avoid extreme resource utilizations and just wasting of time. And there are certain tips like that. And I want to, I will definitely share some of, some of this um, today. Let's go to another excuse. So let's say um, your code reviewer is saying, you don't need to optimize this program because we care about readability and every performance optimization is just unreadable. And also there is a certain truth, like look at this code in, in the Thanos project, which is essentially for um, like very low level index lookup on mem mapped, memory map files. So like, like very, you know, beast to understand and, and, uh, and has to be performant because it's very low level. Yes, this might be definitely, you know, taken as unreadable code. And I'm especially proud of, uh, of this function. It's called YOLO string. Um, and it's actually, it actually makes sense. <laughs> so what we, what we do here, actually in a newest release, we actually rename it and actually test it properly, but that was kind of the basics. Um, and what it allows you is to, is to convert types with while reusing exactly the same memory. Because if you don't know, if you uh, just cast string to bytes, byte slice or cast byte slice to string, you just allocate exactly those bytes. You just copy them, right? Which is sometimes nice, but actually for low level stuff, you are um, over allocating sometimes. So yes, you know, in this case might be, you might need to look on readability aspect. However, I would argue that with the good abstractions and a good balance and this very strict consistency, you can definitely stay readable. You can, um, you know, use patterns that will allow uh, code reviewers and anyone who, who actually look on the Go code um, to feel familiar and, and not be scared and surprised. Another excuse, why would you not maybe optimize your code is, hey, we are in the modern, you know, world, 2020, we have huge machines, by the way, yes, in AWS, you can buy machines that have, you know, 200 cores, you know, terabytes of RAM, easy. Why we care about, you know, performance optimizations of the single process if you can just throw, you know, more hardware. And, and, and that's definitely, you know, some uh, reasoning where um, that will make us think that performance optimizations for the single process is not really needed. However, I will still argue that you know, scaling up um, and just adding more resources within the single machine is not getting you, you know, unlimited scalability power. Like definitely even running a huge Go, by, go applications that have huge, um, you know, that has allocated lots of memory within what one kind of process, you know, you end up with the huge garbage collection slowness in the garbage collection because your heap is huge. The multi-core architecture is actually not super easy, even though the framework is amazing. We have go routines, channels. Trust me, you can have lots of weird saturations from very non-trivial um, aspect of your hardware. Think about, you know, um, your um, different cores and memory um, NUMA and like memory bandwidth between, you know, cores and actually memory and you, and all of those things are very complex to, to kind of debug and, 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 you know, find out what's, what's the problem. So still performance might be important. Last but not the least excuse is, well, we talked about vertical scaling up, right? So essentially just adding more resources to the single, single node, adding maybe more processes, adding more, um, more memory, more disk, more, more network. However, Someone can say, okay, um, okay, this vertical scalability, sure, we need to optimize uh, my code. Um, kind of like we cannot, we don't, we, we cannot just, you know, vertically scale. However, my software is, you know, horizontally scalable. I can just scale out. 
And this means essentially that you can, you know, just um, if you have larger, higher traffic, more users, and uh, instead of adding resources to single node, you just distribute the, the same application into another node and another node and um, distribute the traffic. And this is how you scale. This is how you can um, allow the, the traffic to grow, right? And essentially recently, this is a very popular way of thinking because it's a fashion as well, right? So, you know, I would maybe don't, I would not optimize my code uh, for performance because I can just scale out. I have just another machine, right? And I have microservice. Why, why do I need to care, right? And again, I would argue that performance of the kind of single process still matters. Distributed systems are yeah, just complex to make, complex to operate and very expensive, like just adding another machine, like, come on, like this is, this is taking money. Also, you know, the flexibility, the cold starts, it's not that simple, not that trivial. So at the essence, performance matters, hopefully you agree with me. So now is the question how we approach this problem. And I separated that into like four major steps. First step, um, well, define the problem. Maybe you don't have performance problems. So why do you even, you know, um, thinking about that? Focus, focus on features, focus on, um, you know, kind of growing your product, marketing. But let's imagine you have actual problem. And uh, so first you need to kind of define it, define the root cause, find the bottleneck. And we can kind of, um, for simplicity, we can, well, before we, we um actually go to the bottleneck first kind of um, thing that I forgot to mention is that obviously optimization costs and it takes an effort right so there is a common saying you know don't do optimizations and second rule is don't do it yet and only you know after a very you know large consideration you think about optimizing um, so let's imagine we um, we want to still optimize and now we have a problem and how to define the root cause, how to find the, the bottleneck, right? So imagine we have an API, uh, we are in cloud, we are having requests, and the execution is very slow, or maybe crashing the machine or process kill before succeeding. I can categorize the problems into these, those two buckets. Either something is slow or just crashing. And what differentiate um, between those categories are the resources that are saturated. When your application is just slow or timeouts, it means that most likely the compressible resources are affected. And compressible means you know, CPU time, disk input output, memory IO, network IO, any kind of um, time-based operation, um, when it's affected, it, your, your program doesn't ex does not explode, it's just you know, super, super slow because those resources can compress However, it can be saturated in this way. So if you see this symptom, this is what are those resources you need to look, uh, look after. And what if your processor just crashes? What if your machine crashes? Well, this is where you are using inc incompressible resources um, like storage, um, you know, storage base. Like think about if you use too much memory, well, there is obviously swap, but usually it's turned off. So you just explode the machine. What if you use in a kind of disk and it's just, you know, too small, then you have a problem as well. So by, sorry, by, by, by knowing the symptom, you can uh, immediately categorize at least, you know, from high level, what resources can be affected by the um, behavior of those. But how to get deeper, right? how to actually, so I know about the resource, right? But how to navigate to actual part of the code that, that may be used undesired amount of resources. So let's take the first example of, you know, my, my, my request is just very, very slow in order to timeouts. Um, and I would go in an SRE fashion, side reliability engineering fashion, where we have, you know, an alert. So there is some symptoms, something, uh, something is not working. We have lots of er errors. And in this case, we have lots of the latency uh, is high. So for example, you can use like alert manager. I'm from Prometheus ecosystem, you know, world. So I would be using those system, but obviously you can, there are many. Um, so this is how my alert would look like. Uh, I would go to it on Slack on my phone and, you know, 
for example, my operation on my tunnel system has high latency. This is how I know about this problem. So what I usually do, I drill down, right? I'm use, for example, Grafana or well, Prometheus metrics um, to you know, find out which application access affected. And I can see the duration is very low, right? very, very high actually. So, so latency is definitely affected. So how do I go, you know, what I do with it? Like, okay, how do, what do I do next? So very often uh, what is super useful is to go to your tracing backend because tracing allows you drill down uh, through the actual request. You can search the requests that are slow and then you open this request and it shows you a kind of the, the chain of, um, of operations that happened and how long they, they, they happen, especially in the distributed system. This is how you navigate to actual problem in the what microservice is affected, but also what piece of code is affected, right? Um, and if you know the kind of the operation that the function may be sometimes, you are lucky if you know that. You really need to have a good, well-orchestrated, instrumented system to know that. So sometimes this is not enough. So um, this is where we can use the PPROF in Go, uh, which is amazing, very amazing feature of, uh, of Go, where you run a service which is running 24 hours, you can just access the profiles when you go to slash debug slash pprof and access, for example, um, profile, which this is like literally calling, called profile. And this is a CPU um, profile. So how much um, um, time and on what operation CPU spent, how much CPU seconds, how many CPU seconds, um, you know, um, the, the, the processor spent on on your on your functions essentially and and then kind of some way of uh, presenting this is called flame graph when you download this or you open kind of in the in the web browser it's showing you now what piece of the code actually uh, um, use how much of the of the CPU time in comparing to others so you can navigate to the to the most important part which is in this case, uh, marshalling the text. That was the problem we fixed uh, in tunnels at, the, at this point with this flame graph. Um, and also we can use, uh, you know, graph. It shows you also kind of what, what part of the code, what function was the used, used the most. This is very, very kind of a good way of, of drilling down to what exactly code is affected by the slowdown. Um, the difference between Jager and tracing is that you have here aggregated view of the all requests or the all the operations that happen within certain time versus in Yager within a trace you see the exact single request for single user etc okay so let's say we drill down we solve it what about the problems that you know involves crashing the machine and and you know machine is killed essentially before succeeding what if i see you know and how, how do I see the symptom? Obviously, let's say I'm alerted, but for example, if I'm running, for example, Kubernetes, um, I can see, you know, process is crashing. So I can see, okay, crash loop back off, what happened? This is a very often a symptom of this category of problems. So what I do, I again, try to drill out with metrics. What I see, I see that the memory consumption uh, of my process is, very high and that high that it goes to the, let's say nine gigabytes of memory. And let's say I have 10 gigabytes kind of memory limit, let's say in the Kubernetes. This means that Kubernetes will kill my pod, it will kill my application when uh, when I kind of grow, I may, when my application want to allocate more. So even we can see the, the kills uh, based on the memory allocation, because we can see those drops, essentially there, there was no monitoring. We couldn't even monitor this pod, this application, Go application. So um, we have this gap. And we can see that when it went up again, it was like constantly failing and, and just ooming, we, we call it, right? So out of memory exceptioning, right? Um, and this is right, really non-trivial case to drill down, right? That's why I want to spend time here. Um, but we know one thing, that you know, memory is exhausted. Like we don't have enough memory. Our program allocates maybe too much, or we have too much, too many uh, requests. So how we drill down? 
Um, we can use traces. Well, not not really, right? Because it's not a latency issue. It's not it's related to one request, but it's not very useful because it's latency based, and only we don't have a traces because our pod just crashed, and maybe trace didn't even end up being sent. Profiling, well. It's also hard because I cannot access my profiles that easily because the process already crashed. So I don't have, you know, the memory profiles that might be useful. This is when I would like to introduce you to the concept of continuous profiling. It is very, very amazing concept that just appears in the open source. And actually we maintain a project and a kind of created project for that. It's called Conprof. You can, you can just Google Conprof in GitHub and just, or I will share the slides and there will be a link there. And essentially what it gives you, it, 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 it kind of is similar as Prometheus as collecting metrics. It collects profiles every given interval, for example, every 15 seconds. So whenever processes crash, I can look, uh, I can query all my you know, processes and check you know, a, a certain time and just pick the profile from this time. So I can see what was happening during the, the accumulation of memory, right? So I can be very, um, reactive. I don't need to like debug and whatever. I, I immediately can know what um, function in my code is is problematic and causing the crash loop, causing over like uh, over allocation maybe. Okay, so that's a step one. Hopefully we drill out, uh, drill down to the actual code space. What we do next? Second very important step is to find the run balance. It's it's essentially, um, you need to know immediately that we cannot have all the things, all the thing, all those things that, that you see on, on the screen. Like we cannot have um, super, fast, uh, super fast application with um, low CPU consumption, with low memory consumption and so on. Something has to, has to be sacrificed. So for example, if you want to have, let's say memory, usually memory is very expensive, right? So. And so you want to maybe um, stream more. You want to use more CPU to maybe do more work. However, use less memory. And this is very popular in the big data. However, if your application is not using uh, a lot of memory, maybe it's the proxy. This is like very CPU bound. So um, it's most likely that you need to um, sacrifice memory, pay more and cache more. And this is kind of a waste of memory. However, it actually saves you a lot of CPU that you use a lot. So you need to kind of sacrifice something else. So choose your you know, sacrifice points, choose your trade-off. You need to choose, unfortunately. And sometimes readability is trade-off as well. And there are many others, right? And the funny trade-off is functionality, right? By the way, like I just don't do it. <laughs> That's also a bit of optimization. Okay, step number three. You be aware of the effort and uh, and different methods of the optimization. And there is like a basic overview and like a pyramid of optimization levels, let's say. If you want to optimize something, obviously the most effective way of doing this is to changing system design, making, uh, you know, system design decisions. I change system to totally else. I totally, you know, um, define different caches, define different, you know, proxies. Um, all of those has is super intrusive, changes a lot of things. It takes it takes time, but gives a lot of you know effectiveness. Second thing is changing algorithm, right? So consider essentially the pyramid allows you to think what you should consider first. Um, so before jumping into code and and fixing small allocations over allocations, think about can I change the can I improve this algorithm somehow? Can I change this? This still takes some time. So you need to understand, oh, how much do I have time to fix this problem? Do I have until tomorrow? Then probably system design and algorithm is too much. But if I have a month, then maybe I can go with changing algorithms, which has much more, uh, will be much more effective, you know, um, way of spending my time than actually changing the code. And only when you have, you know, very short time, you should maybe look into micro optimizations within, within the code. That should be the, the order of the, of the optimizations. And finally, how do I do this? How do I optimize? 
Well, there is a flow that helps you, right? So first, there is a bottleneck. Then you do benchmark. And that's kind of a very important aspect of, of the optimizations. You, uh, you want to kind of measure first before you even start the work. So you have a baseline, right? Then you optimize. Then you either, um, then when you optimize with you, you do benchmark again. Now is the question, you know, are you happy with this or not happy with the outcome? If not, then you iterate over it. But on, on every small iteration, you benchmark, you check, you verify. And then um, once you are happy, you run a bigger test, which is called usually load test. And only after that, you ship it and you hopefully you're happy. Um, so essentially major kind of things here are um, the difference between benchmarks and the load test. They are often often referenced as micro benchmarks and macro benchmarks. And for micro benchmark, there are many many tools. Golang has a built Go test uh, hyphen bench. Uh, also some comparing tools like Go bench CMP, Benchstat. There is also other tools that we wrote. Any many many helpers. This is the, the the kind of test you can do on the unit test level or the benchmarks you can do on the unit test level to tell if the application is fast using more or less um, more or less kind of um, memory, for example. And also you have micro benchmarks when you actually deploy and measure, right? And this is definitely tricky, but very, very important when you are doing optimizations in the cloud. Okay, finally, hopefully you are not sleeping and um, you can answer some questions and they will be tricky. So please, um, please give your answers on, on the Zoom chat, but also feel free to speak up. So first kind of task will be, well, we'll be talking about the tricks and, and pitfalls. So there will be three of those. And let's see if you can guess what optimization we can do or what is the bottleneck. So first of all, uh, pitfall number one, we are reading an HTTP response like a normal code, usually well called, you can see that on the many, many, many demo, uh, demo examples. I can say that this code is leaking memory and very heavily in, in worst cases uh, in the HTTP package. Do you know where, do you know why? And you are welcome to speak on the chat, or speak up or maybe talk on the chat. Loading whole response into memory, uh, no, I don't load uh, the whole response because as you can see, I, I use scanner, so it's streamed, so, but good point. Body isn't closed, of course. Yes, body is not closed. That's very important part and I will um, read why. However, that's not the only problem. So body not closed, but there is something else. Uh, essentially here. Body not closed, but there is another one. Do you know what? There is something with the body still. Sure, we need to close, but there is some, something else. Okay, waiting 10 seconds more. <laughs> All right, let's go. So you need to also exhaust the body. What it means is that um, Ideally, when you finish working on this body, on this kind of, and body essentially has a response uh, inside it, right? And um, maybe large response, especially if you are downloading the file, this, the response will be huge, will be chunked, will be buffered somewhere in the Golang um, internals. So what is very useful to do, exactly like Wojtek mentioned, we need to read it completely and only then we close it. Why it's important? And this is kind of, but by the way, this is kind of, I don't know, like silly. I would love if the, you know, library actually do that for us, but there are good reasons. Um, so we need to do it uh, on, our, on our end. So what is happening is that we are reading uh, the bytes and let's say we have an error in the middle of the reading. We didn't read them all. Then uh, some buffers are still kept and, um, you know, some channels, some go routines are still open. 
And until you exhaust them and until you take all the bytes from them, they will be still open for the, you know, until you, you end, you exit your application. So if you do lots of those requests, you can just essentially see the memory going up, 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 and never actually being freed. Um, and you need to close it uh, to ensure those uh, go routines are also closed. If you don't do any of those, or like if you do only one of those, it's also not, not okay. Okay, but this is pretty ugly, right? You have this discard to um, copy the body into discard, so essentially remove all of the um, uh, remainings uh, and close. This is very, you know, not nice. So what we did, what we um, did in Thanos, we essentially created a helper it's called run util exhaust close with lock on error. There are other ways how to grab an error because another problem, reliability problem here was that we were ignoring the error. And usually closers, it's very easy, very easy and very natural to just ignore the error in the defer because how do I even catch the error in the defer? Don't do this, please always check the error. So this um, helper also allows you to um, just log the error, or there is even a, 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 a new method which is uh, capturing the error. So actually uh, returning the error on the function. So this will close, exhaust if needed. Um, so please feel free to use it. We can actually, I was thinking into maybe extracting the, this from Thanos project if needed, but really just state your opinion. Um, I'm using this everywhere on every actually open source kind of code. And I wish there would be something native in the NAS standard library. Okay, next one. Um, so this example, we want to copy. We have a slice. We have a, a very large slice of strings. And we want to copy it into map and another slice. However, this is not a very efficient way of doing this. Can you see why? There is a slice and we are copying that into map and another slice and it's inefficient. We need to read it, comp yeah, happened. What exactly happened? <laughs> I mean, yes, this is a place of uh, ineffectiveness, but why? Because append is always allocating two times more memory than is needed. So, yeah. Yep. Correct. So when Correct. it's getting to the to the edge of its capacity, it's always going double the memory that is needed. Exactly. So even though we know this this thing is very big, we still um, like append only one by one or like actually doubling. So it's kind of optimized, but we could tell from the very beginning how large those slices should be, and we can do that with the make. Uh, and you can have a make on the map, just saying, you know, how large it should be. You can have make on the slice. So this is how you can you can do it kind of better, a little bit better. And those are kind of the, all those patterns I'm showing you, those are not micro optimizations. Those should be actually, in my opinion, kind of used always. Okay, um, last example, continuous marshalling. So what this snippet of code is doing is, essentially going through some received channel, let's say, grabbing uh, one message from it and just marshalling and doing again, again. And let's say there are billions of those messages. Um, and I can say you that it allocates essentially, and it actually creates a CPU pressure and a memory pressure as well. Can you see why? What is the problem with this? Or what we can optimize here? Come on, chat, you can do it. Essentially, the problematic bit is here, pass message by reference. What? You mean the Marshall and send message? Yeah, I think that's not a problem. The problem is what is wrong here or what we can improve here in this kind of line number seven. Um, we are essentially iterate over, um, over what we receive. Every message, we just kind of append messages into single message string. And every time we marshal um, after um, 
we actually aggregate the messages until there are like some certain size and only then we marshal. I'm pretty sure it's very complex or kind of complex to understand like, like one minute. Um, so I will just go for it and explain. So the kind of minor thing here is that we are always allocating a new messages uh, slice. So of course we kind of don't, we release the, the previous one, right? And we the billions of those, let's say. So we kind of release um, all the time, frequently the, the previous messages, but um, they are not released immediately, right? We have a garbage collection that takes time. So um, it will just accumulate. And in some way, in some cases, you can actually uh, have a leak in, in certain ways. So you can see the memory going up until you kind of use all resources. So what you can do in this case, you can reuse slices, right? And there's a very common pattern where you just pass the same variable just by, um, but you reduce the slice to the minimum. However, the underlying array is reused and already allocated. So it's very, very common, good technique to do. Anyway, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm over time. Um, so this is it. Um, quick summary, I, I would love you to resist the excuses and at least consider optimizing Go. And hopefully you know why that you first should define the problem and actually find the bottleneck find the right balance, the trade-off, the resource that you want to kind of sacrifice, understand the effort and optimize and measure and do this incrementally. Always data use you know, the, the pattern of data-driven decisions. And yeah, remember those tips. We actually have more tips. You can check our Go style guide. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I would just really recommend doing, doing this work because in my experience it 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 was so there were so many cases where just this micro optimization someone could say actually helped a lot right and we could see you know huge you know like 97 percent drop in memory utilization by changing algorithm um we have like huge um, kind of impressions on twitter from our users where they were like what is happening like and it was mainly algorithms but also you know small those um you know exhausting the readers and like all other stuff were, were super important. So that's why I would like to motivate you to do this. So that's it. Thank you. And I'm happy to take questions if you have time. <laughs>